So I'm in the Simpich Theater today. It is a darkened theater, like most theaters actually across the world on this particular day. This is Holy Week 2020. And um, my family and I decided that we would do something that we've really had on the back burner for a long time, and that is to have one of our marionette main stage marionette performances available to stream for audiences and people to see everywhere and this is the first time we've done this with a main stage show and portraits really has been on the top of my list to do this with for some time and there's really three reasons for this first of all it is a great show for holy week in our theater for the last, uh, well, maybe 10 years, I've tried to present this show maybe every other year during Holy Week because as you will see in the climax, it's a very appropriate special play for this particular week. Uh, another reason is that it is a play about people and people's faces. And actually the characters and faces in this particular performance are some of the people that have shaped me and held me up in my life. And I have shaped them as marionette characters and held them up on strings to share uh, just a little bit of what they mean to me. It's just a few of the many people that have been so important to me. And thirdly, this is a play for seeing in the dark. And uh, that's really the overriding theme of this particular performance. And it's a play about trusting the one that guides us when we can't see exactly where we're going. That's what this play is about. And uh, there is a verse from Isaiah that actually has always been the frame for this show, for portraits, even though uh, the verse doesn't actually appear in the performance. I've always had it printed on the program for people to see before they see the show. And uh, this verse is from Isaiah. It's uh, 45.3. I will give you the treasures of darkness, secret riches, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by name. Thy right hand will lay hold of me. If I say, surely the darkness will overwhelm me and the light around me will be night. Even the darkness is not dark to thee. The night is as bright as day. I believe that God is in me as the sun is in the color and fragrance of a flower. The light is my darkness. The voice is my silence. Yep, it's mighty quiet down there. Quiet enough you can hear the blood rush through your ears and it's blacker than a frying pan at midnight. Oh, but I'll have my lantern along. Be mighty privileged to take you down and show you around. I now leave, not knowing when or whether ever I may return, with a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. 
without that divine assistance, whoever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. I cannot fail. I cannot fail. I cannot fail. Hello, my name is David Simpich, and welcome to well, a rather unusual gallery. It's a portrait gallery, but here the artwork is not hung on walls. Rather, it is suspended in space on strings. Everything of substance is on strings. Notice these frames held up by sturdy black threads. Oh, but of course, a frame is not the subject matter. It merely offers structure and support for it. It um, sets it off, so to speak. I need to share with you a little of my background, my uh, qualifications to serve as the curator of this particular exhibition. I suppose I have two. Yes, two. The first qualification is that I have been threading and balancing and tightening and knotting and pulling strings for the last, well, almost 33 years. From time to time, when I've been asked about my occupation by an innocent bystander, you know, at, at, the, at the airport or someplace, and I say that I work with marionettes, the response has been, oh, you work with, oh. Now, what was that you called them? And I understand the confusion. <laughs> Tying strings and pulling strings is, well, a somewhat obscure occupation in the grand scheme of things. I suppose, but I have discovered that I have a friend who can assist me in these awkward moments. When someone asks, now what was that you called them? I say, marionettes, puppets, you know, like Pinocchio. Oh, of course, Pinocchio, that guy with the strings. Hello, everybody. I'm that guy with the strings. I wish, let me guess, upon a star. No, that's not it. I wish. You wish you were a real boy. Not particularly. No, I wish. That back in 1956, when My Fair Lady opened on Broadway, they would have come up with another concept for the publicity poster. That's what I wish. Right there on the poster, bigger than life, is a cartoon of playwright George Bernard Shaw. George Bernard Shaw on a cloud with wings. And he has strings tied to his fingers. And the strings reach down to the head and limbs of Rex Harrison in his role of a lifetime as Henry Higgins. And he has strings tied to his fingers, which reach down to the ever-loverly Julie Andrews in the role of Eliza Doolittle. Well, one look at that poster, and any red-blooded theater-goer knew what my fair lady was going to be about. Manipulation. The strings told the story. 
Francis Ford Coppola as the Godfather. Marlon Brando, 1972. It hit movie theaters, and the crowds of people that waited in line to see it knew ahead of time exactly what they were getting into. And how did they know? The stark black and white movie poster showing a puppet control and strings. The Godfather's going to make you an offer you can't refuse because he has the power to control you just like a puppet. Well, Mr. Simpich, you may feel that you have an obscure occupation. You may believe that people don't think much about marionettes these days, but let me ask you something. How many times in the last year have you heard this line? What do you think I am? A little puppet? You can just manipulate? Or how about he's being controlled just as if he were on strings? Or, oh, and this has got to be the worst. Go ahead, take this fine gift. No strings at No strings at Attached. Oh, get me to a doctor. We marionettes may have a rich and colorful heritage in the theater. But in today's society, we operate primarily as nothing, nothing but a worn-out cliché. Oh, I, I think you mean cliché. Oh. oh, okay, well, whatever. Oh, well, Pinocchio, perhaps you should explain why this use of the marionette as a worn-out but strangely popular symbol of manipulation and being controlled is so upsetting to you. Oh, well, let me tell you, and I always tell the truth, Oh, what with my, my little nose problem and all. If I thought that being a marionette was a terrible thing, then I might agree with all the negative images and comments that circulate through our society about strings. But the fact of the matter is, oh, and this may shock you folks, I just love being one. You probably couldn't have guessed it. It doesn't go along with the uh, popular notion of my uh, self-concept. It doesn't even go along with my original storyline, but think about it. Without my puppeteer, what kind of life would I have? So few puppets become real boys nowadays. And I've heard that the ones that are freed of their strings are often at a loss for words and feel strangely listless and inattentive in school. Mr. Simpich, working under you gives me a voice and enables me to stand. Uh, I can't see up to you nearly as well as you can see down to me. Oh, but that's all right. I'll take my cues as you give them. As, uh, well, uh, somebody famous once said, and I quote, <clears throat> without the assistance of that puppeteer, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Mr. Simpich, do you know who it was who said that? It wasn't Howdy Doody, I don't think. Or was it, uh, was it Charlie McCarthy? <sighs> Well, you didn't get it exactly right, but you were just approximately quoting Abraham Lincoln. Really? Abraham Lincoln? Well, folks, take it from me, Pinocchio, and, huh, huh, Abraham Lincoln. Strings? <sighs> are good things. Thank you, Pinocchio. That's a very significant piece of information to keep in mind in a gallery where literally 
everything of substance is suspended from them. Well, and now we must be beginning our tour in earnest. Oh, I nearly forgot. I, I should probably mention that other qualification I have to serve as the curator of this exhibition. It's a small detail, really. All the portraits you'll see in here today as we tour these spacious corridors are, well, figuratively, literally, artistically, and intimately extensions of me. I'll, um, I'll try to hold the light in such a way that you'll know where we're going. O oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou dost know when I sit down and when I rise up. Thou dost understand my thought from afar. Thou dost scrutinize my path and my lying down and art intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, thou dost know it all. Thou hast enclosed me behind and before, and laid thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. Where can I go from thy spirit? Where can I flee from thy presence? If I ascend to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the dawn, if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there thy hand will lead me, and thy right hand will lay hold of me. David. David. Oh, uh, Yes, Nana. Yes, I. I'm right here. Mm -hmm. there, oh, oh, there you are, way up there. Who was that man I just saw walking away? Was it? Yes, Nana. It was him. You know, you were named after him. Yes, I, I know. It's a very fine thing to be named after such a great king and poet. The night you were born, your father was reading the Psalms in the waiting room of the hospital. Oh, the Psalms are just lovely, aren't they, David? Oh, yes, Nana. Uh, David? Uh, yes, Nana. I need to sit down, honey. Oh, of course. Oh, would you like to go into your bed or, or out to the garden? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Well, the garden would be nice. When I was a little boy, my best friend lived just next door. 
my parents had an apartment attached to our house. And this is where my great-grandmother, Nana Ritter, lived. Almost every day, David would bound or fall or sneak or fly over to my little apartment for a visit. Uh, right here, Nana. Yes, I would often find her propped up in bed, sewing little mustard-colored felt coats. Yes, my granddaughter Jan and her husband Bob, David's mother and father, had a character doll business right in their home. I would help out by, uh, by sewing and dressing some of the little characters for them. Or I would visit her in the patio garden just off the front yard. You would visit. Well, let me tell you, very rarely was it David who visited. Some days it was an elf, and other days a character from a nursery rhyme or character fairy tale. I had visits from Dr. Doolittle, Peter Pan, Christopher Robin, characters from the land of the Wizard of Oz, and don't forget Mary Poppins. Oh, oh yes, Mary Poppins made many visits, and with her parrot umbrella, we'd fly away to London for a tea party on the ceiling, or jump through a chalk drawing on the sidewalk. Oh, it made me so happy when David would come over all dressed up. It really was a way of flying away. I relearned to pretend. I learned to believe, to really believe in things I couldn't actually see or hear. Because as I carefully searched Nana's face as we'd play, there was never a hint, never a glimmer, that she was not really believing with me. Oh, oh, but our friendship was even more. With Nana's help, I transformed her little apartment with its beautiful antiques into a, a sort of Victorian museum and invited the neighborhood. One day, I was David's show and tell at school. Yes, I remember you came and stayed the entire day, all dressed up in your Sunday best purple dress and hat. I remember we sat together in the cafeteria and had our, our sloppy Joes. Nana. Nana, do, do you remember? The books. Oh, the books we shared together. Each one a doorway into a different time. A different world, really. Fairy tales. Battles of good against evil. Bible story books and adventure books. Why, we even blew the dust off Ben-Hur and some of Dickens' novels and struggled through some passages. As a former school teacher, it was wonderful to observe David's interest in the historical characters we talked and read about. We'd get so carried away as we peeked into their lives sometimes. It seemed that a few of them were actually right there with us. Nana had a book that had been written by a woman who had been deaf and blind from the time she was an infant. A very determined but sensitive teacher came to help her when she was seven years old. And through this teacher's diligent and loving instruction, she came to understand the world around her through her senses of touch and smell and taste. Her name 
was Helen Keller. I met her once. Although her book was very difficult for me to understand, but I was probably five years old at the time, I became fascinated by this person who was not trapped by having to live in absolute darkness and silence. She cultivated, trained, and ultimately elevated the senses she had to work with. It was said that Helen Keller could determine the color of a rose just by smelling it. She could sense the character of a person by the warmth and texture and movement of his hand in hers. Yes, she once wrote that Mark Twain, her dear friend, had a hand full of whimsies and humor. But as she held it, the drollery changed to sympathy and championship. Perhaps her greatest disappointment was that she never learned to speak clearly. Although she strived to all her life, experts have determined that the sense of hearing is vital in learning to pronounce words properly. Well, a little over a century has passed now since Helen Keller first hammered out her life story on a braille typewriter, carefully checking over her composition with her refined sense of touch. And the story of her journey from darkness to light, from ignorance to understanding, is still being told through countless books and also movies and plays. Her portrait was featured on the 2003 Alabama Quarter. Ladies and gentlemen, Helen Keller can speak clearly. I'll, um, I'll try to hold the light in such a way that you'll know where we're going. Without imagination, what a poor place my world would be. My garden would be a silent patch of earth strewn with sticks. But when the eye of the mind is open to its beauty, the bare ground brightens beneath my feet. The hedgerow bursts into leaf. The silence and darkness, which are said to shut me in, open the door most hospitably to countless sensations that distract and inform, admonish and amuse. I make many excursions to the borderland of experience, which is in sight of the city of light. I believe that God is in me as the sun is in the color and fragrance of a flower. The light is my darkness. The voice is my silence. Even the darkness is not dark to thee. The night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are alike to thee. I remember. 
I remember the day that Nana Ritter received a wonderfully mysterious, heavy package in the mail. David, look what came today from Reader's Digest Books. It's a volume all about our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln, by Carl Sandburg. Ooh, it's big. Oh, but so was Lincoln. It's, it's for you, David. Thank you, Nana. Thank you for placing in my hands the life of Abraham Lincoln. 1864, the Executive Mansion, Washington, a letter to Eliza P. Gurney. My esteemed friend, I have not forgotten, probably never shall forget, the impressive occasion when yourself and friends visited me on a Sabbath forenoon two years ago. Nor has your kind letter ever been forgotten. In all, it has been your purpose to strengthen my reliance on God. The purposes of the Almighty are perfect and must prevail though we erring mortals may fail to accurately perceive them in advance. We must work earnestly in, in the best light he gives us, trusting that so working still conduces to the great ends that he ordains. 1864. The Executive Mansion, Washington, a letter to A.G. Hodges, Esquire. I claim not to have controlled events, but confess plainly that events have controlled me. Now at the end of three years struggle, the condition of our nation is not what either party or any man devised or expected. God alone can claim it. March 4th, 1865. The Capitol Portico, Washington. The second Inaugural Address. Fellow countrymen, on the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed towards an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. Both parties deprecated war. But one would make war rather than let the nation survive. And one would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. Neither party expected for the war the magnitude or the duration it has already attained. Both read the same Bible. Both pray to the same God and each evokes his aid against the other. The prayers of both could not be answered. That of neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God wills that it continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk 
and every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid by another drawn with the sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. The words of King David, Psalm 19. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Strings. Nana, as a boy, I, I couldn't see them hovering above Lincoln's head as we studied his life. But I hear them in his words now, that connection to something, to someone far greater and wiser than he, who was orchestrating a higher purpose in which Lincoln recognized that he, that he was merely a player. Perhaps those who heard him speak that cold, drizzly March day caught a glimpse of the strings. For it is recorded that during the ceremony, the sun dramatically broke through the clouds. His final words that day seemed almost a, a divine proclamation. With malice toward none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right, let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who will have borne the battle, and for his widow and orphan, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Yes, Pinocchio. Strings are good things. There is a photograph of Lincoln giving his second inaugural address. As a boy, my eyes would be drawn to an enlargement of a portion of the photo on the opposite page. Perhaps it was Nana who first read the caption and pointed out to me that John Wilkes Booth was looking down on Lincoln that day from a balcony of the Capitol portico. 
it, it seems that sometimes, just as the connections are making sense, when the lines of hope and promise seem strong and vital, we can be plunged into an impenetrable darkness. Just a month and a half after Lincoln's second inauguration, just five days after General Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse, ending the Civil War, John Wilkes Booth planted a bullet in the back of Lincoln's head. This extraordinary American leader was taken down on Good Friday, 1865. And the desperate hope for a quick and peaceful reconstruction died with him. It appeared then, and perhaps still does to some, that this assassin's bullet had severed the strings. David and I played a little question-answer game when he was young. Nana, he'd ask, will you go to heaven someday? Yes, David. Will you see Abraham Lincoln there? Yes, I'm sure I will. Will you see Moses and Helen Keller and King David and great granddaddy Ritter? Yes, I will. Will you see Jesus? Yes. And then David would say, Nana, when you go to heaven, send me his picture. Send it in the mail or just drop it down in the front yard. <laughs> Promise you will, Nana. Well, sometimes old ladies make peculiar promises to their great-grandsons. I told him I would. I promised that he would get a picture of him. When I was 10 years old, my Nana Ritter became very sick and was sent far away to another city for medical treatment. When I was 11, she died. When I was 13, I was still, but much less frequently, checking the mailbox and in and around the flower planters in the front yard. I was looking for an envelope with a picture. More than anyone, more than anything, I wanted to see him the one on the other end of, the, of these strings. The one who gives so abundantly and then takes before we're ready. The one who secures so skillfully and then at times seems to stand aside while the forces of evil sever and separate the one who promised that he is the Lord of the storm. 
and Lord of the clay. Hold the light in such a way that I'll know where I'm going. <laughs> Thou dost form my inward parts. Thou dost weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are thy works, O Lord, and my soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from thee when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. Thine eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in thy book, they were all written, the days that were ordained for me. And as yet, there was not one of them. Lord of the clay, Thou, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. The following letter to the editor was written by a man named F.C. Cargom, chairman of the London Hospital. It appeared in the Times of London in 1886. Sir, I have been authorized to ask your powerful assistance in bringing to the notice of the public the following most exceptional case. There is now, in a little room off one of our attic wards, a man named Joseph Merrick, aged about 27. So dreadful a sight, he is unable even to come out by daylight to the garden. He has been called the Elephant Man on account of his terrible deformity. I will not shock your readers with any detailed description of his infirmities, but only one hand is available for work. Some 18 months ago, Mr. Treves, a surgeon of the London Hospital, saw him as he was exhibited in a room off the White Chapel Road the poor fellow was then covered by an old curtain. The letter then goes on to describe how the exhibit of freaks in which Mr. Merrick was appearing was shut down by the police, leaving him with no way to earn a living and no place to stay. At the time of this writing, the London Hospital was providing a, a temporary shelter. He cannot go out into the streets as he is everywhere so mobbed that existence is impossible. He ought not be detained in our hospital as his case is incurable. Terrible though his appearance is. So terrible indeed that women and nervous persons fly in terror at the sight of him. He is superior in intelligence can read and write, is quiet, gentle, not to say even refined in his mind. He occupies his time in the hospital by making with his one available hand little cardboard models which he sends to the matron, doctor, and those who have been kind to him. Can any of your readers suggest a fitting place where he can be received, it may well be believed that this case is exceptional. Well, because of this letter, monetary donations to aid the elephant man poured into the London hospital 
and it was eventually determined that he should remain there on a permanent basis near to those who had helped him. A specially prepared, fully furnished, private apartment was to be his home from now on. Located near an inner courtyard within the grounds of the London Hospital. Here he could read from his personal library. <clears throat> open and enjoy the many letters, gifts, and photographs he received in the mail. Stroll the nearby courtyard in the evenings. And on an ever-increasing basis, receive guests. Hello, Mr. Merrick. I'm Mr. Simpich. I've wanted so much to meet you. How do you do, Mr. Simpich? It was very kind of you to come. Would you care for some tea? Oh, yes, that would be very nice. Well, then, let's have a seat here in the parlor. So, very well. <clears throat> oh, oh, I see that you have here the Book of Common Prayer. Oh, pardon me, I. I've just heard that you read the Psalms quite often. Yes, I do. I've committed many of them to memory. They're the most beautiful words in the world to me. Would you care for some milk or sugar? Oh. Milk, please. Oh, here. Yeah. Oh, let me get that for you. Yes. In the 23rd Psalm, where David describes the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, oh forgive me. Oh. Oh, how clumsy of me. I must be more careful well, with the use of only one hand. Oh, here, here, Mr. Merrick. Let me get that for you. In fact, that's why I came to visit you today. Oh, I mean, I, I, I've, he I've heard that you design cardboard models w with, with just your one hand. That's a very extraordinary skill. Oh, well, thank you, Mr. Simpich. I've heard that you, you've made a beautiful little cardboard church. Oh, I'd like so very much to see it. The cardboard church. You, you know of it. Oh, yes, it's very famous. Oh. Like, I didn't know. Oh, but I'm afraid it's not here. I sent it as a gift to a dear friend of mine, a lady of the theater, Dame Marge Kendall. Yes, I, I know. 
It is. Is there anything wrong, Mr. Simpich? Well, actually, yes, there is. But wait, I, I can tell you, Joseph, for although you don't know it, you are a very dear friend of mine. You, like the other portraits on this gallery tour today, have become an extension of me. Joseph, I, I probably know more about some details of your life than you knew yourself. I know that the medical condition you suffered from has just recently been determined to be Proteus syndrome a disease it seems to have afflicted you, as it has no other known individual. My friend, I know how you died, how the weight of your head broke your neck. As you tried just once to sleep, lying down like an ordinary human being, I know of your amazing fame over 100 years after your death. The books, and plays, and websites, a movie. Joseph, I know about a time back in 1982 when I was visiting London. I had just met my future wife, and for our very first date, I dragged Debbie to the London hospital because, because I wanted to see you. Well, the receptionist firmly asked us to leave, which we did. She thought we were the curious. Come us to another freak show to, to view your bones. See, Joseph, your contorted skeletal structure is preserved in the hospital's private museum. Your bones, they're famous. There is a late pop star who once tried to pay a million dollars to own them. And I guess I understand. Your story touched him, too. But Joseph, I want you to know that I came to the hospital that day to see you, not, not your bones. I wanted to see your little cardboard church, which is also preserved there. That perfectly constructed little model with its sure foundation and strong stone towers. A cathedral, really, which somehow reflects the true structure and symmetry. The gratitude, humility, the graciousness of your life. It, like the psalms that you love so much, reflects your connection to God and proves that even in a life of such apparent darkness and isolation, the strings were not. Well, my friend, perhaps I was unsuccessful. But I came to the London hospital that day because, because I wanted to see in the dark.
Howdy, David. Hello, Jim. I thought you might be coming along about now. Yep. You headed down soon? Oh, you mean... Oh, yes. Very soon. Well, you're taking these nice folks along? Well, it is included in a tour of the gallery. Well, that's what I thought. Howdy, folks. Name's Jim White. And I'm standing here today at the entrance to my cave. Uh, call it my cave. Even though it's now operated by the National Park Service. They call it Carlsbad Caverns, which is just fine. I call it my cave because I was the original modern explorer of it. Impressed down deeper into it than even the Indians had ever gone. Oh, oh, I ain't bragging, no. Just grateful for the opportunity. It all began back when I was a teenager, building fences for the Triple X Ranch. One evening, I saw in the distance a strange black funnel-shaped cloud upon the mesa rising up into the hazy New Mexico sunset. Well, I thought a volcano might be erupting, but the cloud, it, it didn't move none. Well, and then there it were again, evening after evening. Well, my curiosity got the best of me, so I decided to climb up and investigate. I discovered that the cloud was really millions upon millions of bats boiling up out of the biggest, blackest hole I'd ever seen. And I began thinking, any hole in the ground which could house such a gigantic army of bats must be a whale of a big cave. My imagination began feasting on thoughts of where the end of that tunnel might lead. And I decided then and there to find out. Well, through a number of um, one-man expeditions in the months that followed, I made my way inch by inch, and then mile by mile, deeper and deeper into the cave. Well, and what I discovered there, well, there there just ain't fitting words to describe it. My crude little kerosene lantern illumined for me a vast subterranean cathedral suspended from the ceiling where mammoth stone chandeliers, clusters of stalactites in every size and color. The walls were motionless cascades of glittering flowstone. Through the gloom, I saw tall and graceful totem poles rising up into the darkness, and I encountered other stalagmites that loomed above me like giants sixty feet high. Well, of course, there were no trails back then. And I always had to be on the lookout for a dangerous crag or precipice, waiting just beyond the light of my lantern. But I was to discover that my greatest challenge lay, well, not uh, deep within the earth, but, well, um, back up on the surface, where... Well, where folks tend to only believe in things they've already seen with their own eyes. I began exploring the caverns back in 1898, and I was just busting to share with anybody, everybody, what I'd seen. And although an operation to mine the bat guano for fertilizer was soon established, it took over 20 years to convince anybody that the treasures that I'd seen deeper in the cave really existed. Well, I, I was called the cowboy, well, not with just bats in his cave, but bats in his head. <laughs> Folks, 
Folks just wouldn't come and see for themselves. Jim, what you're saying is they had no interest or belief in these glorious chambers shrouded in darkness. It did not seem possible to them that the great architect would fashion this magnificent kingdom and then deliberately hide it from plain view? That's right, David. Well, and I personally believe that folks were feared of the dark. Well, after carving out some trails, and building some ladders and staircases and talking to my cave in glowing terms to any soul who would listen, I finally convinced a photographer from town to go down with me, and let me guess, he shed a little light on the subject. <laughs> he surely did. Folks been coming to the caverns ever since. Droves and droves of them. Uh, how many times have you been through, David? I've lost count. <laughs> yes, well, makes me feel uh, we're kind of proud, but mostly humble-like to think that I, James Larkin White, had a part in helping so many folks to, well, as you'd put it, David, to to see in the dark. <laughs> oh, but enough of my cave. What about yours, David? The one on this here uh, gallery tour. Uh, shouldn't we be heading on in? We're already there, Jim. Deep inside. From the moment this gallery tour began, I have been leading these kind people into this vast, dark, silent chamber. Yes, Jim, as you well know, there is a, a magnificent room in Carlsbad Caverns, large enough to hold 14 football fields, and that is impressive. Oh, but this place, it cannot be measured. This place holds the mind. The purposes of God. It is beyond human comprehension. It is eternal, infinite, intensely beautiful. And let's face it, Jim, we cannot see or hear very well in here. Thank God he has given us enough light. Sometimes it seems just enough to move forward. And uh, don't forget the strings, David. They're uh, good things, you know, folks. <laughs> ah, yes, Jim. The strings. If he is holding us up, then it is his vision that matters. Yes, Pinocchio, it is by the strings that we learn to really live. Well, I, I have another short little cave story I'd like to share with you. And it's also a string story. There was once a young man who lived in Italy. He knew a lot about the material world because his father was a fabric merchant. He knew something of war because he was an aspiring soldier. 
He was also a man without strings. He somehow knew he was neither connected to himself or to God. He became so saddened by this that he went up out of his village of Assisi and hid in a cave. He prayed and prayed and prayed. It took some time, but there in the darkness, he began to feel his hands and his feet and especially his heart connect to the one who could truly give him life. When at last he withdrew from the dark place, he was no longer sad. The world had never seemed brighter or more wrought with purpose. He was now a simple man on strings, and he had a simple prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith, despair, hope, darkness, light, and sadness, joy, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. It is in dying. Although Francis of Assisi left this earth many centuries ago, this simple man is still revered today. Many people study his life and teachings and strive to walk in his footsteps. Schools and hospitals and towns and cities like like San Francisco, bear his name. If he were still alive, though, I'm not sure what he would think of all the attention. For as God's instrument, Francis desired nothing more than to disappear behind the identity of another. Nana, if you're listening just now, I'd like you to know that I got the picture. I never found it in the mailbox or in or around a flower planter in the front yard. But I've seen him, his face. I've seen it in and beyond above, beside, in spite of, and through, through so many faces, 
faces that I love and lives that have taught me so much. I have seen his face because of a very good Friday afternoon when when his strings were cut so that mine, ours, could be connected. Nana, I have seen his face in the dark. But of one thing I am sure, all the vast and mysterious corridors of this gallery will always finally lead its visitors back to this portrait on strings again. He is and was and is to come. Lastly, Nana, I have seen his face in his words and in his word. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll try. I'll try and hold the light in such a way that you'll know where we're going. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Abide in me.